Good evening, everyone. My name is Mazi Ezoke. Welcome to the State of the Nation series. In this conversation this evening, I will be having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with uh, uh, Mr. Nemeka Obie-Eriri, uh, who is uh, sitting down here in Lagos and is joining me live from Lagos. This evening, we will be looking at the Nigerian economy and the perspective of this government as to the performance so far. Brother, you're welcome to Ninja Media TV. Thank you. Thank you, Bobby. Okay, let's quickly, I, I understand, um, you know, there are, we, we've, we've uh, had some uh, issues starting, and I will say to our audience, you know, bear with us. We had some technical glitches, hence we are uh, starting slightly late. Now, what's your perspective and what's your take? Considering the uh, government of the APC, when you look into the performance so far, what do you think that the government has offered in the last 10, uh, in the last 10 months? Do you think the government is on track? Or do you think there are areas the government is lagging? the rot, the decay that uh, was the lot of Nigerians over the last eight years. And basically, in terms of pronouncement, they've made good pronouncements, but you know, intentions and pronouncements are different from actions to realize those intentions. The issue of removal of petroleum subsidy, they removed petroleum subsidy, which was good, but they did not follow up action to ensure that the right things were done. They matched the foreign exchange market rates, which was good because before they came to power, we had a multiple exchange rate regime that provided a big trade window for over 300 naira that gave room to some of the worst form of round tripping and forest. Um, fraudulent activities that happened over that eight years. I'll take you back to memory lane. Between 2015 to 2023, if you look at the volume of dollars that inflowed into this economy, plus the reserve that was generated by Buhari, we had a net inflow plus reserve of over $65 billion. Outflow was about $450 billion, $51 billion. So net net, we will have had at least excess of 184 billion dollars and uh, if we were to look at it based on the simple law of demand and supply legitimate demand and the supply the supply of the dollar there's no way to never and the, to the dollar will not have remained at 199 but unfortunately that was not the position that we saw ourselves a lot of Ponzi games happened most of the resources got ferried out of country through unofficial channels that was not documented to the central bank of nigeria and here we are today, 23 trillion printed by where and means against the extant laws of the land, 10 trillion intervention fund thrown into the market 
we had excess money supply that we are not used for productive purposes just consumption few men sharing most of this money is to the treatment of the masses so over nine ten over ten i give them i score them four percent in terms of pronouncement in terms of taking both decisions they've done what most government could not do the one of subsidies. of course subsidies here is still back they were still paying subsidy because some of their actions made us to the made the data to be thoroughly or the, the, terribly devalued to just to understand that every gain that we we'll have expected to have made have been wiped out because currently we pay one trillion naira every month it's estimate on a subsidy but there are things they can do to the situation if they are sincere but most unfortunately their body language their pronouncement are not matched by their actions we will have expected them to cut cost of governance by 30 percent by 50 percent but that is not the case rather than shrink the cost of governance they've over bloated it very hard for the two ministries triple had 40 brought in 45 ministries they will have multiple ssa ssa positions that are conflicting for the first time in the history of Nigeria, national assembly budget got skyrocketed to about 344 billion naira 167 billion naira squandered over eight months 17 billion as location allowances 40 billion for a purchase of suvs and 57 billion for rice palliative that they didn't even share to most of their constituents so it's been a from frying pan into fire situation like we have seen today but it can be remedied if they're very, very sincere but over 10 has scored them for, for uh, over 10 has scored them for Okay, thank you very much. Four percent. I mean, um, for undergraduate, 40 percent is uh, the is, is a pass. You're basically at the borderline. Uh, for a postgraduate, forty percent is a you know catastrophic failure. That's um, that's that's what it is. So it depends on Nigeria to basically determine how they would want to view this. But you said something that I I want to pick on. Is, you know, the, the question now is, could the floating of Naira have been done better? Do you think, because, uh, you know, uh, as of May last year, in as much as um, the Naira was being shored up, we are still, you know, within the range of six, 700 uh, uh, Naira. I mean, with, that has gone over 100%, you know? I mean, in... Uh, in let, let me tell you of a truth. Hmm. If they have not, if what happened between 2015 to 2023 had not happened, the Naira would have remained at 199 at worst to a dollar because we had excess dollar inflow, more than excess dollar outflow through legitimate transactions. The valuation and uh, margin of the foreign exchange market rate wasn't the problem because no country actually floats entirely their currencies it's called mm. managed float mm. from time to time this the federal reserve bank of such countries usually intervene yeah. deploying different monetary policy tools yeah. to make sure that their currency in fact some countries actually deliberately devalue their currencies vietnam japan um, 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 japan china sometimes allow their value of their currency to be low so because it will make them to export more mm -hmm. to make their exports cheaper because most of those economies are very productive but the challenge we had was that we weren't producing anything our major oil foreign forex and the crude oil resources over the last eight years we've had a special where over 22 billion dollar worth of oil resources are looted on an annual basis based on even the report of the oil that the nmpc now basically what they will have done before they even announce the removal of any management um, the, of, of floating the currency, they will have ensured that we have enough reserve, enough liquidity to be able to fight off activities of speculators. That's number one. Number two, the monetary policy rate of 22 points, of 22.75% that they increased recently is something they will have done from the first day. They will have been, they will have increased that NPR as at that time. And number two, they will have, they will have blocked the leakages. Sixty percent of the demand for the dollar is criminally driven. 
they will collect fact, they will collect jack, and they will begin to pursue the dollar. If they have sincerely taken the step to say, okay, we are going to ban use of dollar cash in Nigeria. Any dollar usage of dollar cash above $1,000 will attract two years' imprisonment without option of fine. And amend the relevant laws to support this. And they remove the bans that they removed eight months after in such a way that people can bring in their dollar at whatever rate that they want to bring it and they sell at whatever rate. By now, we wouldn't have been where we are today. If they have also taken urgent measures to have worked, they said, see, nobody outflows dollar out of this economy without it being documented in such a way that you cannot just buy dollar from the black market and then walk with the cowboys in the deposit money banks to take it out of Nigeria without it being recorded. So there are many measure steps they will have sincerely taken, you know, to stop the leakages, to stop the criminal demand for the dollar. And when people see their sincerity, you will have seen a lot of diaspora inflows. I say to anybody who cares to listen, the, our greatest export is not the crude oil. Our greatest exports are our diasporas. Our diasporas can comfortably inflow $100 billion into this economy on annual basis when they see transparency, when they see accountability, when they see sincerity on the part of those who purport to govern them. I would have expected them to have caught cost of governance. I would have expected them to have said, okay, presidential fleet, 11 out of 11 aircraft, seven sold, only return four or three. I would have expected them to just do what he had do did amend relevant law, declare their assets and liabilities publicly, and the Gate National Assembly that is, is very pliant to amend the law. So, okay, going forward, every public office order must declare their assets and liabilities publicly. They will have even gone for that to so, okay, provide the whistleblowing provision in the act in such a way that if any Nigerian have to blow whistle and any assets are recovered, they will get 20 percent. When people see transparency, when people see accountability, when Nigerians have seen that these guys are serious, there won't have been any fear. People were trying to protect their monies by turning the currency into a, an asset holding instrument. Basically, what we have seen today is erosion of confidence, erosion of trust on the political elites across board. Only very few of them have retained the courage, like someone like Alex Oti today he is one of the very few, if not the only governor in Nigeria today that have that have that social capital that has the confidence of the electorate. You can hear a lot of investors saying we are going to Abia. You could hear a lot of diasporas asking me, doctor, what can I invest in Abia State and all those stuff. So basically they missed opportunities of doing what they are supposed to. Anyway, there's the last math maxim that says you cannot place nothing on something or nothing and expect it to stand. These guys have demonstrated over time that they, they, they do not have the overall interest of the masses. It has always been a risk-seeking culture. They have precedents, their antecedents have shown clearly that they do not sincerely want to take those hard bodies that will have fixed this land. So that is where we are, why we are today. Thank you very much for that insight. Now, you know, if I go specifically again, because again, what we are looking at is what the government can actually do. Um, if we take, for instance, you, you mentioned the over bloated uh, government, and yet the same government that you alluded <laughs> to that has over bloated, um, you know, um, appearance of over, over bloated government. Is still saying that they have started the implementation of Orasanya's <laughs> report. Isn't, isn't that you know? Isn't that contradicting? Because we still have forty something ministers. I mean, you know, uh, the fleets, the 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 eight fleets that are there. You recall during the Jonathan time, the APC government <laughs> were. That's one of one of the things they went to town with. That the 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 federal government had uh, so much aircraft, and uh, in the eight years of Buhari, none of those aircraft were sold, and here we are. We're still maintaining that same fleet. What a contradiction that uh, the same government want, wanting to implement Orasanya's report that dwells majorly on cost saving. How do you think that, you know, looking at the two uh, narrative, is it possible to, to marry them together? You, you cannot marry them together. You see, the, the worst thing that have happened to these guys is that. They, they've, they've made the average Nigerian to believe that they have lying and propaganda as their DNA. Lying and propaganda has become, distracted propaganda has become their modus operandi. To most Nigerians, they believe that the, or the dropping of the 
of the banger that they were going to implement the Orasana report was the role of the strategy that he has to keep on the facade and pretend that they are doing something. Is it not the same government that just came in and dropped the banger that they were going to share one and two million thousand a metric ton of grains? When actually we know we don't have that kind of number of grain. That's the country that in 2020 borrowed 5,000 um, metric ton of grain from ECOWAS. So, you know, the sincerity is not there. And that is the major problem. See, um, it's okay. If I am Mr. President, from day one, if I, if the first sign will have been, I will have cut the ministries down from 42 to 20. That will have been the first thing I will have done. I will have announced immediately that the presidential fleet I am selling down seven to local um, airlines in Nigeria. Number, I will have, you know, put in place measures, just like, do you know what made Nigerians fell in love with Yadwa? For the first time in the history of Nigeria, the president declared his assets and liabilities publicly, mm -hmm. and that of his wife and the family. It has never happened in the history of Nigeria. And they brought about the rule of law mantra. You know, if he had not, had not taken away Yadwa, Nigeria will have built upon the gains of the Obasanjo ATS government. If I am Mr. President, what I will have done, even before I announced the removal of subsidy, is to do an in total in-house cleaning. You cannot build upon nothing. We know that the petroleum ministry and oil and gas industry had become a cesspool of corruption over the last eight years. We wasted $16 trillion, $34 billion on subsidies and free on around maintenance program. A serious government, a government that wanted to win the confidence of Nigerians, will have said, I will institute proof to find out what happened to those monies. Between 2002 to 2009, the daily PMS consumption in Nigeria was 28 million or less. In fact, it never even got 28 million liters. In fact, the only time we got to 45 million liters was under the Ziani and Jonathan in 2010 and 2011. And the House of Red Group showed clearly that 30% of that number was actually posed. We were actually consuming about 29, 30 million liters a day. But all of a sudden, under Buari and Mike and Tibaro and the rest of them, the number moved to 50 million, to 60 million, to 68 million, even to go to a point where they were saying that we are important and consuming more than 2 million liters of PMS a day. That would have been enough trade. A serious government that wanted to win the confidence of Nigerians will have said, hey, the same way we did the, the probe of 2011, we are going to probe what happened over that eight years. To find better for, for maybe they were scared of Buhari because Buhari was the petroleum minister. And of course, I will not, I, maybe because of the way they came to power, the questionable circumstances, they didn't want to rock any boat. If I am Mr. President, the first thing I will have done from day one was even begin to implement the Rasaya report. When Yadua became president, Yadua acknowledged openly that the election that brought him to power was flawed. And he began to put in place. That was when he, he panned the OIS report to bring about electoral reform. If the same circumstances was the circumstance that eroded the emergence of the current president, if there was that sincerity, the first thing we will have done, oh, hey, there are questionable circumstances beyond this. I am going to just do like Yadua to implement wholly the OIS report. There are many, one million and one things the president will have done that will have boosted the confidence of Nigerians. We will have even said those refineries that are passed in 2007, which was erroneously and the fourthly re re revised by Yadwa. Mm -hmm. He will have said quickly, I am privatizing these refineries. I am doing this, I am doing that, even before the moving subsidy. In the next eight months, people will start seeing white petroleum products. A lot of things will, in the issue of security, he will have said, okay, the current security architecture is not working. We have wasted $27 billion without fixing it. We are, you will have announced, we are reverting back to the security architecture we had in, 20, in 1963, 1960, where the communities and the municipalities will control their security and ensure that their lives and brothers are protected. You will have even consolidated on the executive order of, of Buhari by saying local government will be made to be autonomous. You will have unleashed EFCC. 
on those Aram boys that they call local government chairman, that will collect local government and association and hand it over to the governors. In such a way that in the first three months, at least five or six of them will have been prosecuted to show transparency. A lot of things this government will have done to boost confidence and that will have saved us from where we are today. But they didn't do it. You know, it has always been, they've always believed in this culture of party man business. It's a, they see politics, they've elevated politics over the good governance and the good conscience. And that is where we are today. And it's a lot of time for what is happening today in Nigeria. If these guys are sincere, if they decide to quit politics, there's enough time for them to retrieve the situation. They have three years to call the past. It is not yet late for them to do some of this on the internet. It's not late. You know, you 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 you're you're talking about that it is not late to do the honest things. If I take you back, for instance, Yeradua, you highlighted it. Yeradua openly, you know, uh, declared his assets, made a copy, copy of his assets, you know, to the press. Now, here we are. Buhari took over, even when he campaigned that he was going to do the same, he didn't. And here we have a man who didn't promise that he was going to do that. Now, he hasn't done that. Are you aware if, because I have asked people, I haven't read where it's been done. I have not read where they said the president has declared his assets, even if it's the normal secretive way of doing it, then he has submitted it statutorily. Are you aware if that is done? I am not aware, but you know one thing that shocks me? I lost my old father at the age of 72. He was a very strong man, six feet two, very strong man, a, a soldier to the core. But do you know what happened? While my dad was alive, I remember even when he was 69, 70, he had to give up most of the things he was doing just to enable him rest with his grandchildren. Any man that have crossed 70 should be conscious of life after he is, and should even devote most of his remaining life. Because most of us are either Christians or Muslims, and we believe in afterlife. We believe in the Supreme God that will judge us. Either we we'll go to hell or we we'll go to Ajana or we we'll go to hell, uh, we we'll go to heaven or, or, or paradise. Or every we believe in it. So I expected a 70-year-old man plus. To have what is what is the life? See, it has always been the life ambition of Mr. President to be president. He had worked for it since 2004. Mm -hmm. And fortunately, yeah. God allowed him to be president. I won't say God, he got himself to become president. You do you know what it will have been or what you'll have amounted for it to if the guy had gone ahead to to, to destroy every every doubt. That people had about him by doing most some of some of this is a not big deal. Declaring your answer liability publicly. Yeah, I do I was very sincere. And that was the reason why Obasanjo supported him. Because Obasanjo looked around. Of all the governors of his class, it was only him and Peter Obi that distinguished themselves as men of prudence, as men of integrity, as men who left reserves and who did not steal their state resources. So between him and Peter Obi, it, it was the turn of the north. So Obasanjo did not even waste time picking him to support him so you know i i sometimes i sit down and i begin to imagine do these guys understand that there's a life after a year you saw what happened to that good man our our brother Abbott Mingwe. Abbott was a man of the people Abbott lived a good life Abbott lived a impactful life you could hear the testimonies everywhere. Harvard went extra mile. So what he was trying to do, we, we were in university to make it mm -hmm. like Harvard. Mm -hmm. That is a 58, 50, 57. Harvard went to 58 when we lost Harvard. At 57, Harvard was already thinking legacy, doing legacy things that will immortalize his name. But yeah, you see 70-year-old men, 75-year-old men who should devote the rest of their life building legacies, still playing politics. I just don't understand. I cannot fathom it. Well, it's um, it's uh, indeed a tragedy. I will take you to this, um, you know, we've been, we've been, you know, they've said that uh, the Port Harcourt refinery um, was being tested. 
and we had expected that by now the Potakot refinery would have started working. Isn't that an aberration that up till now, none of the refineries are working? I mean, you know, sometimes, I don't know if you think like this, that I found it so hard to believe that Nigeria, a nation so blessed with oil, cannot refine and uh, an oil, you know, cannot refine oil that it can use I say you have a well in your house, you dug the borehole, yet you cannot extract the water to even use and bath. And you go and, <laughs> and you go and import water to bath. So what's happened to the refineries? Let, let, let me tell you, you, you are even talking about you know, is, is it not shocking? The first refinery, 60,000 barrels, was done by Tafa Beloa. In three years, he started and completed it. The second refinery. The war refinery, 125,000 barrels, was done in three years. I go on. The second one, go on and Obasan, between Obasan job, go on and the and Babangida. It, over a period of 1972 to 1986, 14 year period, three brand new refineries were built. Three brand new refineries were built in 13 years in 24 years we could not repair those no, but kudos to obasanjo obasanjo after six years saw the profligacy saw the uselessness of allowing that refinery to be under public sector arrangement he decided to concession 60 percent of the shares of those refineries to the blue star consortium of Aliko Dangote, and the rest of them. But for whatever reason, Yadua came to power and they misadvised him and he ruled back. If that if that privatization had not been reversed, by now we'll have been refining everything we consume here in Nigeria. Buhari came into power and he even said, he even asked Tori Kari, where is the subsidy? Eight years, the man squandered. He was petroleum minister, he was commander in chief. The first thing that happened under him was that. Crude oil that was at average of 2.5, 2.6 million barrels a day came down to less than yeah. 1 million barrels. Yeah. Under his regime as petroleum minister, crude oil was being stolen, you know, like sweet. The, 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 the GMT of NNPC told us gleefully on national daily that we lose $1.9 billion worth of crude oil every month yeah, to no drifts, inefficiencies, to losses. And the most unfortunate thing is that for those eight years we were losing those oil, nobody was arrested, nobody was prosecuted. The Auditor General report of 20, 2018 showed that 2018, 2019 showed that there was a record of 107 million barrels of crude, what 10.4 billion. That could not be accounted for. So then, you see, and these guys keep on awarding contracts, keep on incurring losses under normal circumstances. Where there is sanity, where people are sincere, where people love and fear God. What is there in building a refinery? If you if you privatize those refineries today, as, as, as we are talking now, tomorrow they privatize those refineries to private sector investors. In 18 months or even in one year, those refineries will come for. I have a guy that worked in those refineries. The guy told me that with $500 million, sincerely, Bringing back those who built those refineries to repair those refineries, those refineries will start functioning very, very well. Now, are you aware that South Africa that does not even have five percent of our crude oil volume have refineries that combine capacity of five hundred and four thousand barrels a day? To Tafina Health, Chevron, the oil IOCs have refineries in South Africa. How come they don't have refineries in Nigeria? The first refinery that was built in this country was built by Shell. So the truth is, these guys are not sincere. They see the petroleum industry as their slush fund. If they are very, very sincere, look at liquefied Nigerian liquefied natural gas, LLNG. LLNG is owned 51% by private investors and 49% by NMPC. It is one of the most profitably run PPP enterprise in Nigeria. And they, they, they pay 
billions of dollars dividend annually. What stop us from divesting federal government shareholders in NPC down by to 49% and allow private sector investors? Because they know they do it. Oh, Those mean, private sector investors will not employ you based on your color or your religion. They will employ only capital people, just yeah. like in LNG. The board and management of the NNPC will no longer become based on nepotism or who you like or who you don't like. It will be based on competition. Staff that will work in NNPC will not be employed based on where you come from. It will be based on competencies. And I tell you, if they do it in the next three years, the volume of investment that will come into the oil and gas industry will be so massive that we'll begin to wonder what happened. These guys know the right thing to do. You know, some, some of us are tired of complaining. They know the right thing to do. Oh, it's it, well, selfishness, greed, penchant for criminality will not allow them to do it. It's not necessarily about complaining, you know, because when, you know, one of the questions I wanted to ask, you to pick your brain on is, I look at it, I say, we were told that we now pay full subsidy. Recall that on May 29th, Adley, the president said the subsidy is gone. And the, you know, the, uh, the, the media warriors and the media vuvuzulas went to street to tell the world that they have removed full subsidy. And here we are, Paying twelve for subsidy, isn't that criminal? I mean, if it is not criminal, I don't know what else that we can call that. It's estimated that we spent over a trillion naira on so. Let me tell you, the landing price, the FOB price of a liter of gasoline, which is PMS today, offshore loan, is sixty nine cents. If you use the official exchange rate of about one six three five to multiply it, FOB. Offshore loan is at about 1,200 and something naira per liter. That we are still buying it at 600 simply means we are subsidizing even more than what we are paying as PMS, as PMS subsidy. And we are subsidizing it because of the forex, the, the valuation of the naira. See, we've come up with a novel idea of how they can also solve this problem. But they won't do it because, see, we also came up with a suggestion all over the world. Productions are subsidized. You don't subsidize consumption. You subsidize production. If you look at the refineries that we have in Nigeria today, the oil refinery has capacity to refine 125,000 barrels of crude every day. The Botakot refinery has combined refining capacity of 210,000 barrels a day. The Cardinal refinery should be scrapped because it uses the Venezuelan um, 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 heavy crude. It would be stupid and silly if anybody to be telling us that we want to be putting crude oil from Venezuela to be refined in Canada. They should scrap that thing and sell off the metals. Then, if we decide today, NNPC put the refineries into an, a special pocket, call it SPV, and they sell 80% of those shares to private. Sales. I'm not asking you to get foreign investors, there are local investors, the downstream oil operators. They'll buy up those 80%. Of course, with a promise that in the next two years, the 50% will be sold to Nigeria and it will be listed on the floor of the exchange. Let me tell you what will happen. Those private investors within the next 22 years will collocate additional 160,000 barrels of crude oil in that same location, either Portacot or Warren. And let me tell you what will happen. Under a defined cost plus margin arrangement, to produce crude oil in Nigeria, Maximum is about 31, 31 dollars. To refine a barrel of crude oil, it costs about ten dollars, so it's forty dollars. If you are even allowed the operators to make thirty percent margin, it will be thirteen dollars thirty cents. That is fifty three dollars. That is total cost subsidized production. Total cost plus margin is fifty three dollars thirty cents. If you use official rate to multiply it, production plus a margin of 30 percent is about 520 naira per liter of any of the petroleum products either pms this zone that is not selling at 1700. now by the time you put on the logistic cost of moving it from the refineries to the depots to the filling stations just add 200 naira but boy yeah, there is no way any of the white petroleum products either gasoline gasoline or gas oil we sell for more than 750 naira anywhere in nigeria even with removal of subsidy under this to subsidize production arrangements. And then you don't even need to use the crude oil that we need to export. You can give them marginal fuels. 
for them to drill and produce crude oil for those refineries. And they result up an SPV, just like we have the Nigerian uh, uh, Buck Electricity Trading Company. You stop Nigerian Buck Petroleum Trading Company, where you have an SPV that will make sure that those people do not take those products so they find for consumption here outside Nigeria because it's a subsidized production. That SPV now should be made up of members of independent petroleum marketers, members of Nupeng, NLC, TUC, Nigerian Power Station, in such a way that every of these products, if you only find 495,000 barrels of crude in Nigeria, it will meet our honest daily consumption of not more than 32 million liters a day. But we even have excess. 32 is, these are creative ideas, creative concepts that have worked elsewhere. But these guys are not interested in things that will work. They are not interested in things that will add value to the life of the people. They are not interested in things that will build collective prosperity. They hear us say this is everything. They know it is possible. They know it can be done. They know it is done. It has been done everywhere. But they won't do it. Nigeria can actually produce over, over 3 million barrels of food every day. We can sell off our open quarter of 1.7 million and then refine it for that thing. We will control the whole sub Saharan African market in terms of white petroleum product. We can ramp up our reserve to about 40 billion barrels. They know. See, let me tell you, we don't even need Shell or Chevron or IOCs to bring in investment. If we provide transparency in that in the whole value of oil and gas sector and decide to float diaspora bonds or diaspora equity linked instruments mm -hmm. to bring in $1,300 billion annually, most diasporas will subscribe to it Correct. because it is transparent and they know why, why will a, a doctor who earns worth ten dollars every year in America put his monies in an American bank where they will pay him interest of 1% when he can buy a five-year a debt instrument, a 5% debt, coupon debt instrument that is used to drill oil in Nigeria that will help bring prosperity and job in Nigeria. They will prefer to invest there. But the truth is, those who purport to govern us, those who purport to rule us, they know this. Let, me, let us not deceive ourselves. Because even if they don't know it, we have been saying it. I've, I've repeated this thing on our rise on channels. If they are very sincere, because some of us don't even want to work with them. That's the truth. Because you cannot, I don't believe in dining with the devil with a long spoon. Not even try it. Take the template. We'll consult for them on at arm's length. Show them what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. In three years, this place will be always of prosperity. In security, to day to day, we have spent with seven billion dollars. There is no security in Nigeria. Now, the same president said that he was going to recruit you. Now, I, you know, and I think it to my mind. So what happened in Kankara in Kaduna State? Mm. Two eighty people abducted by bandits. Imagine if the communities are had vigilantes in the community that are fully armed with AK forty seven with armor tanks. There's no way those bandits will have had their easy way. Now, what do we do? We can decide today based on the same philosophy of Mr. President. We have 8,809 electoral ward in Nigeria. In every electoral ward, you recruit 200 youths, train them in the army. But not in case of where you train them and you push them outside their community. The army will train them. They will call them, they can call them paratroopers, part of the army. They can call them the whatever name, but they are part of Nigerian army. But they are not going to be posted out of their community. We train them in every elite out of the eight thousand eight hundred nine in each of the eight thousand eight hundred nine electoral wars. Train two hundred youths in those community in those electoral wars. Give them AK forty seven in every local government area. Provide two armored personnel carriers. Innocent can produce it, and in a very cost effective manner for them to use. If you have two hundred paramilitary or military trained youths in their own electoral ward with AK-47. Then in every local government area, you have two armored personnel carriers, and they have drones, and they have communication gadgets, and they get their communities. In six months, you will look for bandits and terrorists and unknown government in any part of Nigeria, you will not see them. And these things will not cost anything more than seven to eight trillion naira, which we can even borrow, even if they want to present them print it to do this. And if we were able to provide security of lives and properties using this novel arrangement, Nigeria will be secured. I don't believe in state police giving this, some of these um, um, uh, fraudulent governors control of police. See what they did with our police and imagine what they would do when they have their own police. 
bring 200 youths from every electoral ward in Nigeria, train them as part of the Nigerian army, but post them in their own electoral ward to protect their people, hand them over AK-47 under the Nigerian military command. Unless you, how Nigeria will not be secured. Well, I mean, <laughs> that's, uh, that's, that's a very noble idea. But, you know, the, to, to the question that I, wa I want you to, um, um, you know, pick on this, is this act of paying subsidy not criminal? Because where is, there is no budgetary allocation for this. So how are we getting the resources? No, NMPC is a limited liability company uh, on paper. Of course, it's hundred percent owned by the federal government of Nigeria. They can actually expense it and call it whatever name. They can call it on the recovery as a limited liability company. They can make losses. They can make profit. Remember, it is as a, <laughs> the, the, that is why I said the PIB, the petroleum industry bill, is a flawed bill because NMPC can actually is, is, if they decide that. Remember, there was a time towards the end of Guare's uh, tenure, that NMPC was not even paying any copper into the federation account. Yeah. Remember that was the time, that there was even a month they did not pay uh, anything. Because they're a limited liability company. They are owned by the federal, federal government of Nigeria on behalf of the federation, 100%. So even if they decide to, if they declare a law, there's nothing that's coming to There's nothing you can do. That law is flawed. And that is why I said, we need to divest Federal government, if we want any piece to work like the British Petroleum that declare annually over 25 30 billion dollar profit, if we want any piece to work like the Nigerian liquefied natural gas that declared billions of dollars dividend, even after paying all the royalties and taxes, we need to divest Nigerian OT in that. If it does, um, in, in, in any piece, it's not about six two billion dollars. Even by even that divestor, we have about like two billion dollars coming to the federal accounts seriously, which will even help us to show up liquidity against the forest volatility we are having today. Okay, let me take you back. Uh, let me take you back to the issue of money printing. Um, Wale Edun, um, yesterday said that the Buhari's eight years of printing money without productivity cost the inflation that you know the inflation that we have today now we have had stories where um you know the previous government's been blamed for the quagmire that we found ourselves in the former okay. central bank governor um godwin mfl is behind bars being investigated as we speak now some school of thought say between 26 to 32 trillion was printed question is why are we now blaming the central um, the, the central bank, blaming every other person, but nobody actually questions the person at the helm of affairs, that is President Muhammad Buhari, for authorizing those printing? <laughs> Let me tell you, in, in, in South Africa, um, the former president, what was that his name again? Jacob, um, uh, Jacob Zuma. What was the name of that? Jacob Zuma. Eh? Jacob Zuma. Jacob, Jacob Zuma mm. was tried and docked. Nothing happened. The heavens did not fall. You know, it's even laughable. When I, anyway, it's, it's, it's a Nigerian political thing. When this APC came to power, they were chasing only Deziani and the Dasuki. They forgot that there was a commander in chief that would have been brought in for questioning. They forgot that we are other actors. Of course, there's always the poster boy that they will use to do propaganda. Now is see, Emefile is not blameless, but I, I can tell you, Emefile is just one of the boys. You see, it was a, a free for all bazaar over that eight years. If these guys are sincere, if these guys are sincere, at least we should have at least 100 to 200 operators who worked under that regime across all the MDAs behind bars, like Emefile answering questions. And let me tell you. If a serious forensic inquiry, a serious forensic investigation, a serious recovery efforts are put in place, we can easily recover 100 to $120 billion from some of these guys that worked on that body for eight years. So the question then is, I mean, obviously we know the government is corrupt. We know one or two things happening. Question then is, you know, it isn't isn't that isn't i mean 
doesn't that bother them? Doesn't that bother any right-thinking Nigeria? Why those things are not happening? What you know, basically, from your ben, analogy, ben, what ben, you're saying ben, is. Ben, Bezebub cannot cast out Bezebub. That's my answer. Bezebub cannot cast out Bezebub. Okay. Now, uh, before we conclude here, yesterday, um, over 280 two, you know, kids, I uh, refer to them, were kidnapped in Kaduna. Recall that um, 276 children were kidnapped in uh, the Chibok saga that drew the world attention. And we here we are, similar to that number, kidnapped. As I speak to you, it appears nobody cared in Nigeria. These are young and innocent lives. Shouldn't that bother Nigerians? Uh, by now, I should have been expecting that there is a total outrage. These are 280 children kidnapped. My, my my brother, it has, you know, I feel sorry for the poor. I feel sorry, for, feel sorry for the less privileged. I feel sorry for those who have nobody to speak for them. Interestingly, in Nigeria today, the political elites, once they are ensconced and protected by their armored, armored vehicles, they have police and army guarding them. They don't care. What, there is no empathy. There's no compassion, there's no sympathy. You saw the, when the Chibok thing happened, you saw the up uproar that greeted it. You saw the outrage. Americans were shouting. President Obama was screaming. Where is Joe Biden? Where are the other civil servants? Where are the other? You see, we've gotten to a level in this country where we've assumed some of these things to be new normal. How can 280 kids plus their teachers be fairly the way? What logistic arrangement was exactly. used? To move them to such an extent that there was no military intervention, the Air Force did not go on or immediately take off the pile. Where are they? Where are they? Oh. And this is Kaduna. Kaduna that has Air Force base, that Kaduna that has NDA. So where were the Tucano jets that we purchased? Where are the attack helicopters? Where are the drones that we purchased? So how were they able to carry the 280 children? 80 kids plus that chess. And they could not scramble jet within a space of five minutes to track them and know where they are going to. Come on. on. Let us stop feeling ourselves. This has become a business. A business that has become hydra -headed. I just gave you an example of how we can stop this madness. And they know this, but they won't do it. Get the military. Get the be a special military force. We can call it community paratroopers. Military trained 200 youths in every of the 8,000 8, electoral electoral wars in Nigeria. Arm them with AK-47. Provide innocent constructed two armored vehicles for them in every local government area. Let them work together. If they do it, in six months, there is no inch of Nigeria that will be occupied by any bandit or kidnapper. They, they, they know, they know, we wasted 27 billion dollars in eight years expanding insecurity from northeast to that part of the this thing i have shared with you i will not take anything it will not even take up to 10 trillion naira to execute in six months this country will be so secured as it was in 1963 but i tell you it's okay they won't do it these guys don't care all they care about is share loot buy dollar buy properties binge and that is the end of it Nigeria is so unfortunate. In other part of the world, we have earthquake, natural disasters. In Nigeria, what we have is political disasters, which is worse than hurricane, which is worse than earthquake. God have mercy on us. God indeed have mercy on us. Thank you very much for being uh, finding the time to join me. But, but before I let you go, at the beginning you mentioned about you mentioned Abia State. Abia State, uh, in the last couple of days and weeks. I've been in the news for the all the good things. You know, we have a geometrics by uh, Professor Barton Naji, um, though not entirely um, totally functioning, but you know, within the next couple of weeks, um, hoping that it will come on stream. You know, you just alluded now that the Abia State has become the new uh, destination for investment. Are there things other? you know, governors and maybe uh, even the president can actually learn from that state. 
Um, LSOT just continued from where P2B stopped, and I'm so excited. I tell you, I was privileged to speak to some a group of diasporans who graduated from the medical school in between 1976 and 1982. These are accomplished physicians. Some of them have lived all their lives in America and the UK, and they're trying to see where they can invest their dollar. And interestingly, some of them from Bayesa, some from other parts of the state, even when I mentioned their own state, they will shout. They said, everybody's going to Abia State. It, see, Nigerians are not difficult to please. Is that is is it, there's nothing so special Alex is doing apart from that? Alex is using the Abia resources to invest in Abia State, and people are seeing results. Have you seen his budget? He's the first governor in the history of this country to budget 42 percent of his state budget for social investment, education, and health. Come on, but there you is, know, but, there course, is a, the, but there is but there is another angle the, to the, it, of course. Is that what? There is another angle to it. The 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 borrowing, yes. borrowing four hundred billion. That's no no. See see. Okay. Listen listen. It's a budget deficit, but he never told you he was going to borrow. You will have asked, how is that deficit going to be funded? It's a question people have not asked. Mm -hmm. You know, people assume that he's going to go to. You know, some people are saying, oh, he's going to go to borrow. Um, so can you can you can you throw more light on that? Then how is that going to be? Is that what? Can you throw more light on that? How is that going to be funded? See, let me explain to you. Mm -hmm. LX, which is going to be executing loads of private public partnership arrangements. Remember, he mentioned the issue of the Chinese company that he's talking with, that he's discussing with, um, that wants to do light drilling for Nigeria State. Um, similar things have, have been done in Ghana. It's a $2 billion project. It's PPP. 300, 300 kilometer rail project is fully private public partnership driven. Let me tell you, the state can actually provide guarantees. The state can do a lot of things to support private sector investors coming in. I was sharing with somebody, he budgeted almost about 7% for agriculture. That 7% may not be enough to revolutionize agriculture, but it may be government contribution to private public private arrangement. Like I have. We have an agri, one of the biggest agro park in Arabia, in, in, in Southeast in Arabia State. As I'm talking to you, we're moving personnel into, we abandoned that agro park because of insecurity under the last government. We lost over 308 million in that project because we could not have security. But Alex has come with a lot of goodwill and we are moving personnel, we are moving equipment, we are moving resources and investment into Arabia State. Many people are not even aware that Arabia has loads of cocoa plantation. Close your eyes and imagine where in the next four years, in every com every electoral ward in Nigeria, you have 50 hectares of palm plantation or 30 hectares of palm plantation, 20 hectares of cocoa plantation. Nigeria State is already in the process of putting setting up a commodity board, just like what um, 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 Dr. Michael Alvarez did. See, guys, there is hope. Nigeria State is going to have a PPP refinery very, very soon. Nigeria State is going to be developing a mega um, industrial park at Owaza. I will be using gas and some of the electricity from geometric to power. See, let me tell you, one of the things that drives manufacturing and installation power. are power, efficient transportation, gas, and security. LXOT is poised to bring about the infrastructure revolution that will bring investors lining up. And interestingly, he has one of the best um, advisory group, global advisory group. Okonji Wala is part of it. Professor Ndubisi Kwe is part of it. And his son Ndubisi works for other government and collect money. For Iber State government, he's really free of charge. Yeah. Yeah, LX has goodwill. Some of us are offering our advice services free of charge. Some of us are bringing investors into Iber State free of charge. It's our part of way of showing appreciation to one man that decided to follow a different path than follow the criminal part of what happened before him. I can see that you're quite excited um, about Abia State. On uh, on you know within within last week, I had a conversation with um, uh, the former uh, commissioner for information, and uh, he actually said that uh, some of the roads being done were the roads attracted by his predecessor. You know, um, like the Potakot Road, and they are not being given credit. For the attraction. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. Government is a continuum. Somebody governed the state for eight years. 
they, they were concerned that they, are, they brought um, Czech Republic, they brought and Mr. Dominic. Biggs, they brought... Um, Domino Pizza. They, they, did, they, did they not indicate, tell us what they brought? It's okay, let us talk politics. Please, we have moved from the realms of governance, uh, politics. We are in governance now. Mm. There's a government in the state that is ready to govern. The past is past. Mm. Come back 2027 and you will see the records. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Nemeka uh, Oviariri. Uh, he's a financial engineer, investment banking executive, uh, development economist, and volunteer change agent. My pleasure having you this evening. Thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, my brother. God bless you. Thank you, and good night. So, um, everyone, it's been my pleasure to have um, these one-on-one uh, -on -one conversation with uh, Dr. Nemeka Obi Areri, and who joined me from Lagos. You know, it's been a conversation. You've heard uh, the way forward so far. The advice is being given to the federal government of Nigeria. And what appears in his view not happening now is that the federal government appears not to have the political will to tackle most of the ills that befall our society. On this note, I will say thank you very much for joining me. And I want to uh, personally thank uh, Festus uh, O.C. Feso. Thanks very much for that super chat. And um, do appreciate that. For every one of you who keeps watching us, but you haven't subscribed to this platform, by all means, please do subscribe. For those who keep, vomit, who keep coming back and are subscribed, please, by all means, share this video with within your WhatsApp group, share it with your friends, share it with your family. And I am still Mazes, okay? I will say to you, good night and God bless. Bye for now.